Hello everyone and welcome back to Talking Wild. I'm your host Stefano Daza and I'm so excited to have you here for episode 3 of our Zeba podcast. Before we get started, I'd like to thank everyone who has been tuning in for our weekly episodes. If you'd like to support our Talking Wild channel and our other Zeba projects, head over to our website at zebaapparel.com to shop your favorite Zeba merch. All right, on today's episode, I'm joined by my good friend, Yatin Kelki. Yatin is a herpetologist, which means that he is a biologist with an interest in the ecology and natural history of reptiles and amphibians. Yatin has a bachelor's degree in wildlife conservation from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and has done herpetological research in the United States, the Amazon, the Galapagos Islands, and in various parts of India, which is where he lives now. In our conversation, Yatin and I dive deep into herpetology, more specifically what it is, how it's done, and why we even do it. We discuss the vilification of snakes by society, talk about modern day snake conservation efforts around the world, and briefly touch on the influence of famous conservationists like Steve Irwin on younger generations. You'll find that Yatin is a young conservationist who is building a career out of his passion for snakes, and I think that this conversation will be of great value to aspiring biologists from all around the world. So without further ado, I bring to you episode three of Talking Wild. Today on the podcast, I have a good good friend of mine, one of the most incredible people that I know. Um, this conversation is bound to be a really good one. Yatin, Yatin, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks for having me, Stefano. Good to have you, dude. Before we get started, I just want to say that even when I was just thinking of coming up with this podcast and I was thinking of people that I could have on, you were top five on that list. So it's it's actually super exciting to have you on, man. Good. I'm glad to be here, man. So Yatin and I actually met in the Galapagos back in 2016, was it? Yep. Back well, first Ecuador and then the Galapagos. Yatin was is a herpetologist, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But before that, I didn't know what herpetology even was, and I would just see him looking for reptiles and snakes and lizards and like taking pictures of them. And he was just so good at doing this, and he would be out all day throughout the night. He had all the equipment, and I was just super amazed by him. So in this conversation, that's what we're going to talk about is uh, herpetology, what it is, how he does it, his experiences with it. And I'm sure that a lot of our audience has never even heard of this kind of stuff. So I'm sure that's going to be a really good conversation. So Yatin, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you do it. All right. Um, so... I, I don't know if I'd call myself a herpetologist just yet. I mean, I've only been working in the field for a couple of years now, um, but I am a biologist. And uh, most of my interest in research um, focus, focus mostly on reptiles and amphibians, um, especially snakes. And uh, what I do uh, pretty much revolves around the ecology and natural history of these animals. And most of my previous research has been focused on that. Um, I started out uh, like with an interest in snakes basically because um, in India we have snakes living all around our houses and sometimes they get into our houses um, and I'm sure that you know like you've spent a lot of time in Africa right yeah and um, yeah you probably know about the situation there with the uh, snakes coming to people's houses sometimes yeah. things like that um, so yeah when I was off adders yeah forest cobras I've seen a lot of videos online of like crazy snakes getting into like these small houses and yeah it's it's got to be scary for those people yeah. man, but venomous yeah um so we have a similar situation here with uh cobras and russell's vipers and other snakes that get into people's houses quite often and uh when i was about 16 or so um i started noticing that a lot of the snakes that were in my neighborhood were getting killed by people because i mean that's the first thing that's the first instinct when you see a snake um and i've always been kind of i've always had like a soft side for snakes um because i grew up watching steve Irwin and jeff corwin and those guys and you know they're all about the conservation of these animals even though they're maybe scary or whatever and um i decided to start you know i learned how to catch them and i started relocating those snakes um in my neighborhood so that they wouldn't get killed by my neighbors anymore 
and uh, that's what really sparked. How old were you? I was 16 when I started. Wow, crazy. And you were inspired by Steve Irwin, right? Steve Irwin, Jeff Corwin, Nigel Marvin, all those guys, they've been a great influence on, um, I guess, a whole generation of young herpetologists. And conservationists in general. For sure, yeah. That's why I hate how they've been getting a lot of criticism from PETA and animal rights groups saying that these guys harass animals and, you know, by catching them and everything. I think the last thing that they they would ever want to do is hurt these animals. And I think that the impact in general that they've had on a generation of um, kids, now adults, um, mm -hmm. by inspiring them to go into conservation, animal um, well-being has vastly outweighed any negative consequences. Oh, for sure. If yeah. Any yeah, but I mean, you got to like also consider from the other point of view of like um, some of the stuff that they were doing. And I'm not like trying to criticize these guys because these guys are just legends in my mind and probably right. everyone else's. But some of the stuff they did back then isn't super um, required or, you know, scientific. What kind of stuff did they do that was uh, a little over the top? Well, some of the stuff that they like um, in terms of safety, like... You need to use a hook or tongs or something when you're handling venomous snakes. A lot of like the free handling stuff isn't uh, super advisable. And um, a lot of the grabbing snakes behind the head, um, virtually nobody does that anymore. At least no professional does that. Um, and like, I don't know, I think it was pretty popular back then to like show off the fangs of like a viper by holding it behind the head or like, you know, milking it or whatever. But, you know, unless you're actually collecting venom for research or anything like that, there's really no need to do that. It stresses out the snake. But, I mean, all of this aside, the um, the amount of value that those guys added to the herpetology community um, by just inspiring all these young people, it was, yeah, just invaluable, cannot be measured, just priceless stuff. A lot of it, I assume, was also just for showbiz. You know, they wanted to show how crazy dangerous these animals were. And you could only do that by showing the fangs even though it was a extremely yeah. necessary. So, I mean... I mean, yeah, like, a lot of these, uh, especially a lot of these, um, like, Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, they're all about ratings, right? And um, they, the, the producers and the filmmakers, they will ask you to do a lot of crazy stuff, even if the presenter, um, who is oftentimes a conservationist or a professional in the field, isn't super comfortable with it. So they're kind of forced into a lot of the time. So I don't, I don't blame them at all. That's crazy, man. So, before we dive into the actual danger of herpetology and everything, I think we should take a step back and kind kind of dissect herpetology in general. So, I remember when I was talking to you that you told me that there is a huge misconception of... Okay, so before we even get there, what is herpetology, for those people who don't know? Okay, so, herpeto... Um, it's a Greek word that means to creep. And then ology is the study of. So it's the study of things that creep. So just off, off the bat, you know, it's kind of like a negative connotation to the whole thing. But, you know, um, snakes and uh, lizards and things, they do creep. And so uh, under herpetology, we've got reptiles and amphibians. And then um, that broadly covers... Uh, what we study in herpetology and then you know there's different spe uh, specializations within each of those things like uh, I mostly focus on snakes but there are other herpetologists that may focus mainly on lizards or mainly on frogs or maybe Sicilians or crocodiles or anything else. And this is crazy because most people would just be mind blown as to why you study snakes um, reptiles in the first place given that they are you know most people are terrified of snakes. Um, there's this really negative role in, or really negative idea of what these um, predators are. I think a lot of it might have been just evolutionary wired into us to fear snakes. So why do you go out of your way to study these potentially deadly creatures? Um, you know what? Uh... Well, snakes, if you want to look at it from a purely anthropocentric standpoint, um, if we didn't care about snakes, and let's say all snakes wouldn't exist, I think we would be worse off. Because one thing that these uh, animals do for us is they're excellent rodent control. 
they control a lot of the uh, pests, especially in like third world countries or like developing countries where like uh, rice, things like that um, is one of the staple diets, right? So um, rodents have a devastating impact on these things, on those uh, food um, food crops and snakes do us a great service by eliminating those pests. The other thing is that certain um, venomous snakes, they have compounds in their venoms that can be used for medical like research. Like uh, for example, the copperhead, um, which is a snake that's found in the US, um, it has certain like uh, chemicals in its venom. I'm not completely sure about the details about this, but apparently it's been used in uh, breast cancer um, treatment. No way. So, yeah. And this is a good point to ask what the difference between poison and venom is. Snakes are venomous, right? Not poisonous. Well, what is that well, difference to someone who doesn't know? Um, so some snakes are venomous and poisonous, but it's kind of confusing. Okay, so the easiest way to think about it is um, if it bites you and you die, then it is venomous. But if you bite it and you die, it is poisonous. All right. Uh, so that, venom. I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So venom is something that they have, um, which is typically injected, and it's something that the snake uses to uh, subdue its prey. Poison is more of a defense mechanism to prevent the animal from being eaten by predators. Um, and that's not injected. That's like within the tissues or whatever. So um, uh, there's an example of a snake called the uh, redneck keelback. There's tiger keelbacks that they're out in uh, Southeast Asia. These snakes are both venomous and poisonous, which means that they, um, they have venom, which they use to catch uh, frogs and toads. And right. it's really interesting because the the uh, poison that's in these toads, toads mostly, a lot of toads have inherent poison to prevent being eaten by, you know, other animals. Right, that's so why what you... these snakes do is, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so what these snakes do is they, uh, they catch these toads, they eat them, they've evolved a resistance to this uh, toad poison, and they use that poison um, in their own bodies. They sequester those compounds in their own tissues so that if any other predator attacks these snakes, um, they will use that poison in defense. No kidding. So they're basically stealing the power of their prey to use it for themselves. Yep, pretty much. Okay. And is there a difference between the effects in the body that poison and venom has? Like I heard that venom coagulates your blood, so it makes it go from liquid to solid. This poison, is that true? And is there a difference between what poison um, and venom? So I'm not a... I'm not a chemist and I'm not like a venomologist or whatever, but so I don't know a lot about the details, but typically um, venom is, uh, I mean, poison um, needs to get into your GI tract, your gastrointestinal tract to affect you. And venom needs to get into your, you know, like blood or your you know, circulatory system to affect you. So theoretically, and I'm not recommending anybody try any of this stuff because it's not advisable at all, but um, theoretically, if you had no cuts in your mouth or no ulcers in your GI tract, you could safely drink snake venom. Um, but it's not the same with poison. No way. Yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah. Complete, um, you know, warning, disclaimer, whatever. Yeah, don't do this stuff. It's just completely theoretical. Please don't do this. I don't want us to get sued. <laughs> but that is crazy if that's true. That's absolutely mind-blowing. Um, okay, so let's get back to the role of snakes and reptiles in society. And it's known that they are, like you said, regulating of the ecosystem by keeping prey populations down. Um, how have they been affected by our current climate crisis? So climate change, habitat loss, what's happening right now in the world of snake and reptile conservation? Um, as far as climate change goes, I know of a few um, populations of snakes in uh, especially like um, high elevation regions that are not doing too well because of the increasing temperatures and things like that. But, you know, I haven't really gone out there and done any research on that. But I will talk about, you know, other threats, um, non-climate change related, more, more related to like development, maybe just human involvement that are really uh, threatening the existence of uh, certain reptile species. 
so yeah, obviously habitat loss is the biggest one. Um, you know, you know, conserve the snake's habitat, and you will conserve a lot of species that depend on that habitat. Other than that, we've got you know several other things. There's uh, certain diseases that these snakes get, um, and then there's obviously you know human humans killing snakes, the uh, direct persecution by humans, which uh, affects a lot of snakes, especially around uh, residential areas where humans live. Um, the biggest roads. the snakes. Um, habitat loss, no doubt. That's for pretty much any like wild population of pretty much anything. Habitat loss is the number one threat. And these guys live virtually in all types of habitats. Like except Antarctica, but yeah. Pretty much yeah, almost everywhere. So to conserve snakes, we just we need to protect all our wild lands right now. It's not like a specific type of habitat that we need to conserve to save the snakes. It's pretty much. Um, yeah, that's a very general way of looking at it. Um, I think to conserve any wild animal species like habitat loss, I mean, uh, habitat conservation and habitat protection is the first line of defense. That's the first way, you know, to really make a good impact. Um, but, you know, a lot of snakes, since uh, a lot of them are dependent on rodents, and rodents um, kind of live commensally with humans, they depend on like our garbage or whatever, they live alongside us a lot, a lot of the time in our crop fields or whatever. Um, a lot of snakes will survive even in, you know, human altered environments. And um, those snakes, uh, they're typically generalists and they're not like, you know, any uh, vulnerable species that are you know threatened with extinction but there's a saying that says keep the common species common so we want to make sure that uh, you know we're doing our best to even help these you know typically abundant and common species survive um, so that we don't have problems down the line in the future that's cool I, I, I like that one of the things that I want to talk to you about was something that I actually experience with you and the Galapagos. Um, so a little backtracking so that people understand. The Galapagos are a archipelago out in the Pacific Ocean owned by Ecuador and it's extremely wild. It's where Charles Darwin um, first inspired was inspired to come up with the theory of evolution because of just the diversity of species and, and each island has different varieties of each species. Um, and they have been conserved pretty well, except for a couple islands that have been populated with people. And those people have been allowed to bring their cats and their dogs uh, to the island. And I guess because of the lack of control, there are feral cats and feral dogs in the islands right now. And, you know, a lot of people might not realize this, but feral cats and feral dogs, as you can attest and talk about, are probably the worst thing for an ecosystem and the animals in that ecosystem. Yeah, don't get me started on feral cats, man. Like, oh boy. Um, yeah, feral cats are bad. Bad for the environment, bad for any small animal that lives there. Um, they're an invasive species. Just bottom line, they're an invasive species. Which and uh, we got... Because they're pets. Exactly. Yeah, but we've got a lot of... We got a lot of cat lovers out there who um, will defend their right to keep their cats outdoors, and um, you know, not care about the devastating impacts that these you know like cute furry little animals have on the local wildlife populations. And we got to see some of this, you know, you know, some of this devastation up close when we were in uh, the Galapagos Islands. So um, there's an island called Floriana. Um, I don't think we, I think we took a trip out there. It wasn't one of the uh, islands that we visited on uh, our island hopping trip. But yeah, it, it's an island called Floriana, which uh, has a huge population of feral cats. And Galapagos has these endemic snakes called um, racers, Galapagos racers. And the feral Those cats have extirpated. Planet Earth 2, they were the snakes. Oh yeah. If you haven't yeah, seen that. that was... Uh, do yourself a favor and go watch Planet Earth 2, the Islands episode, and you will see the most epic chase of these snakes chasing a baby marine iguana, and it's absolutely epic. Yeah, that was 
yeah, that is some of the best filmmaking I've ever seen. Like, well, those are Fernandina racers from uh, Fernandina Island. And, uh, yeah, uh, the ones on Floriana have been extirpated by the feral cats. So one of the things that uh, I got to do when I was out in Galapagos was uh, join a herpetologist um, or conservationist researcher named uh, Luis Ortiz Catedral. And uh, he was basically uh, surveying for uh, these racers on the little like satellite islands that were off the coast of Floriana Island to see if the uh, populations of uh, the racers there would be strong enough um, that if we moved a few of those racers back onto Floriana after extirpating the cats and the rats and other things that threatened these snakes, we could reintroduce them and get that population back. Um, so that, yeah, that was cool. We got to spend a couple days on a boat um, off the coast of Champion Island doing these surveys for these snakes. And uh, yeah, that was, that was a great experience. Did you personally witness any cats or dogs killing reptiles? Um, yeah, we got to see cats killing both of the endemic geckos on San Cristobal Island, which is the one that we were on for um, right. study abroad. So there's uh, two species of geckos. There was uh, Philodactylus darwini and Philodactylus lei um, on our island. And we got to see cats killing both of them, as well as marine, uh, not marine iguanas, lava lizards. But uh, there are several records of those cats killing the endemic racers, um, the eastern Galapagos racer, which is also found on that island, and the marine iguanas, obviously. And the, the iconic marine iguanas of the Galapagos. And the what I think is most tragic is that these animals evolve in full isolation, so they have no defense against these predators. Their fear of these animals is minimum, if any. So cats, which are notorious hunters, just completely wipe them out, completely wipe them out. Yeah. And the fact that the, the government has done very little to control this is very sad. But um, yeah, I think it was just important to touch on our pets. And you know, we love our pets. And we're not saying you know that your cat is necessarily bad, but even just having a, a cat, your cat will bring dead birds to you or dead snakes to you or to, you know, here in the United States. So when released in a highly vulnerable environment, you know, it can be devastating to, to have those cats or those dogs out there. Um, tell me a little bit about the current state of uh, snakes here in the United States. So there's two things that I want to touch on. Um, I just want to know how much you know about these things. First, it's about the uh, invasive pythons in Florida and how being like literally bounty hunted out there to control them. And then the other thing is this fungal disease happening with snakes. Um, forgot the name, but let's start with the, the pythons in Florida. What do you know about that whole issue? Like, tell us your input, your opinions, et cetera. Um, so the pythons are definitely a um, important issue and uh, it has been getting a lot of media coverage, a lot of attention. Um, yeah, so I went out to Florida a couple times, and uh, yeah, I found a Burmese python once. Um, and I know so that there's plenty of people have. Python, sorry, are from mm -hmm. Asia. Yeah, they are from uh, Myanmar, Burma, those areas. How did they get here? Um, well, it's mostly because of the uh, reptile trade and like uh, people wanting to have exotic animals as pets. So I think I'm not entirely sure about this, but I think uh, there was I think it was Hurricane Andrew that uh, took out one of these uh, reptile breeding facilities, and then all these animals escaped, and they established a wild population um, in the Everglades. And uh, the most recent research has been showing that they're actually expanding out of the Everg Everglades and moving north. And uh, with climate change, that's only going to get worse because they have more inhabitable, you know, habitat. Yeah, yeah. But, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I Do think, these, yeah, it's... Predators? Like... <laughs> I don't think they have any natural predators other than maybe a uh, uh, alligator or two that may take, like, a juvenile python. Um, but, you know, they, the Florida government or whoever, I'm not really sure who's in charge, 
but they've been doing a great job of trying to eradicate these animals. They have people out there all the time, you know, hunting. I have several friends who go python hunting all the time, and um, you know, I have a great soft spot, soft spot for snakes, but not for invasive species. So the same thing. I love cats when they're inside, but and when a species is outside and causing devastation to these native environments, it needs to be taken out. And, you know, I think they're doing a good job. There, There's a lot of people who I follow who are, like, taking out, you know, five, six, seven pythons every night that they go out. Just, How do they, I don't know if it's enough, take- but... Um, well, the, I would say, like, the normies, the noobs, <laughs> pardon my uh, language, um, those guys who don't really know much about the ecology of these animals and they just want to go out and, you know, hunt snakes um they'll just road cruise um yeah maybe <laughs> um they just drive up and down like roads uh, that cut through habitat in the everglades or like surrounding areas and they wait to see these pythons crossing the road um which isn't a really effective way of taking out um snakes because they also end up running over a lot of other non like target species so native snakes while they're doing that um, I know a lot, like a few people who are really in tune to how these animals behave and they'll actually go to places where they think they might be nesting or where like gravid females might be and they go and find them by tracking them. And uh, oh, this is really interesting. Um, the, uh, so there's a tribe of snake hunters in India called the Irulas and uh, they have been like, their thing is to hunt snakes. Um, they used to do it for the skin trade back in the day, but now they do it for conservation, which is amazing. And uh, all this stuff is brought about by Romulus Whitaker. I'm sure you heard of him. The, um, Who is that? Romulus Whitaker. He's uh, called the Snake Man of India. He's um, an awesome conservationist who is, you know, originally American, but he settled down in India and he's done, you know, just so much for Indian snake conservation. But he has um, harnessed the skills of these Erlas. Because these tribals, they know exactly how to track these snakes. They can look at like a small mark on like a sand road and tell you like how big or like what species that snake is, what direction it was headed in. And then they go and dig these snakes out of the burrows that they're in, Um, which is like it takes just so much experience and skill to do that stuff. Like I can't even imagine. I, you know, I, I also, you know, hunt snakes for a living, but not to like just to catch them and take photos of them and stuff. But, you know, finding snakes is super hard, even when you actually know what you're doing. But these guys just, they're on another level, man. But yeah, so these guys, um, they got permission to go out into the Everglades and uh, hunt pythons with uh, some of the people who did it locally. And they tried to teach the locals their uh, skills. And they were out there for, I think, yeah, like, I think it was one year ago, two years ago, something like that. Um, But they ended up catching a lot of pythons. It was great. Um, and how, the way they track these animals. How yeah. far do these guys get? Like, how big Python. are these invasive pythons? I'm not exactly sure, but um, I would say up to like 12, 15 feet, something like that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's massive, man. How? Man. So, are they just eating all the native birds? Like, the. Are they eating deer? What are they exactly consuming out there to get? Eating birds, mammals. Um, there's even a few records of them eating alligators. So it's yeah. Oh my God. These guys will eat pretty much anything they can grab and constrict and fit in their mouths, um, which yeah tends to be a lot of animals that fit that criteria. That's wild. So okay, so that was one thing. What is this? fungal disease that's wiping out snakes? So um, snake fungal disease, um, SFD, um, as it's commonly called, is a disease that, uh, have you heard of uh, like uh, white nose syndrome in bats before? Okay, so it's kind of similar to that. It's a fungal disease that affects the outer, you know, skin of these snakes. And I had some experience with it in uh, the Midwest when I was at uh, college. We used to do some surveys, and we often found snakes infected with this. Um, and we obviously had to, you know, disinfect all of our equipment um, to prevent it from spe- spreading and all that stuff. So it was it was a big deal, you know, especially where we were in Illinois. And uh, what it does is it affects the outer layer of these snakes, and sometimes it affects their um, their eye caps as well. So they'll have this like cheesy buildup um, 
inside their eye caps, so they won't be able to see. And um, these snakes will typically start basking in more open areas and um, start moving around more um, and not go into hibernation when they need to, which causes a lot of uh, mortality, obviously, because when these snakes are exposed, they get eaten by other things. And then um, if they're also not going to hibernation at the right times, then uh, snakes are cold blooded. And as the temperature drops, they also you know, are affected by that. And how widespread is this disease? Is it throughout the entire U.S.? Where can we find it? I think it was mostly in the eastern United States, and I think it might be spreading to the west as well. Um, I'm not up to date with the, you know, like re most recent stuff on that, but I do remember a few records from out west. And is it very deadly, guys? Oh. It spreads, yeah, it spreads um, quite a bit. Um, it spreads very easily, and uh, because a lot of these snakes, they hibernate in like these common dens or like common rookeries or whatever. So a lot of snakes will come together in winter to hibernate, and then they'll you know spread the disease, and it you know it kind of decimates a lot of populations that way. Same thing with bats, you know, like uh, they roost in these huge colonies in winter, and then the white nose syndrome spreads through the colony and. Uh, you know, it wakes them up before, um, you know, winter's over. So then these bats are kind of like looking for food because they've already used up all their energy resources. They go outside and it's, you know, freezing cold. There's no insects. There's nothing out there. And, you know, they just end up dying. So it's it's pretty bad. And um, we haven't really um, come up with, a, you know, a treatment, I don't think. But uh, my university was uh, studying that, studying about, studying the effects of snake fungal disease on um, Western Massasaugas or Eastern Massasauga, sorry, and um, finding uh, a way to treat it if there is. But the main thing is basically dis disinfect your gear if you're moving between sites. That's the main take-home message. That was going to be my next question is, what is being done about this? Because you bad. But to get up to our next topic, I want to know more about your specific work in herpetology, catching snakes, like, First, tell us how you got involved. So you told us that you were inspired by Steve Irwin. Started when you were 16. You went to school for animal biology, but how did you get uh, into snake uh, herpetology? And how can others who are interested in herpetology follow your footsteps to do the same stuff? Um, okay, so I'll start off by saying that I don't think anybody should follow my footsteps because uh, I did some questionable stuff when I first started out. So, um, you know, it started off with trying to uh, prevent these snakes in my neighborhood from being killed. And I knew that I needed to learn how to handle snakes and, you know, safely bag them so that I could relocate them away from, you know, people who were trying to kill them. And uh, the way I did that was um, I basically just started the first thing is learn all the snakes in your area, okay? Learn how to identify every single one because identification is, you know, number one thing in, like, snake handling. You don't want to go grabbing, you know, snakes um, in, like, a careless manner if you don't know whether they're venomous or not. So um, in India, in my area, luckily I only had a few venomous species. There was cobras and Russell's vipers, um, and they were very easy to ID because, you know, the cobra and the Russell's viper, they look very distinct. Um, the remaining species here, most of them are typically harmless to humans. And um, I would go out looking for snakes in uh, the natural areas around my house. There was like, you know, a bit of habitat. And um, I would try catching the non-venomous snakes and photographing them and stuff. And I practiced with those. And um, as I got better at catching them without being bitten, then I started catching venomous snakes. And um, as people started seeing that, oh, okay, this guy is going out and he's catching snakes, you know, he's some kind of weird freak. But, you know, we can, <laughs> we can call him uh, whenever we find a snake because we know somebody who now deals with snakes. So that's what happened. My neighbors, uh, my neighbors started calling me more often whenever they had snakes around their houses because, I mean, to be honest, nobody wants to go out and deal with a snake and kill a snake because that puts them at risk, right? right. Um, a lot of people who get bitten by snakes are trying to kill these snakes. So approaching the snake, getting that close enough, getting close enough to kill it w puts you at risk. So it's probably much safer to just call somebody who um, knows how to do it and, you know, have them uh, catch the snake and move it away. Dude, this is, so, yeah. 
this is like one of the things that I admire most about you. Like you just love snakes so much and you have found a useful thing in society to apply this love for snakes, which is snake relocation, which actually helps preserve these species by preventing people from killing snakes, keeps people safe, keeps the snakes safe. So, dude, I think that is the coolest thing. And I love it, dude. Keep, please. Thank you, Steph. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, con continue. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I'll never forget my, uh, my first venomous snake call. Because um, I, even when I would go out into the, like, the habitat, the scrub forest near my house, and try to find snakes. Even if I saw a cobra or Russell's viper, I would not want to mess with it. I yeah. would take photos of it from a distance. Yeah. Um, so I was catching like rat snakes and water snakes and wolf snakes and all these other snakes. Um, but one morning I get a call from a neighbor that lives a few houses down from me. And uh, they say that there's a snake that's coiled around their like faucet, their tap in their bathroom. And I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so I go over there and uh, the guy tells me, that he went to, so he went to the bathroom, and uh, like after finishing going to the bathroom, he went to wash his hands, and before he could touch the the faucet, he heard a hiss. So he turned on the light, and he saw the snake coiled around the uh, the faucet. So I was like, oh my god! So I got there. It was a pretty big speckled cobra, and uh, this was my first uh, venomous snake call. So I was like, okay, I don't know what to do now, but you know, I'm here. Might as well catch it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, I just used my hook and I got the snake into the bag. Um, and the whole time I was shaking, like I was very scared. How, so yeah. how do you catch these things? How do you catch a snake safe without getting bit? Um, so I'll tell you some of the stuff that I did back in the day, you know, like tailing snakes and sometimes even grabbing them behind the head and stuff like that. Um, it was because I didn't know enough about the behavior of these snakes, but the more I got to interact with these snakes, and um, the more I went on these calls to, you know, remove snakes from tough places, um, I would say that the handling is only about 20% of uh, the job, okay, like containing the snake or getting it into a bag. Um, and I would say the other 80% is being able to predict the snake's behavior. So if a snake is along like a wall of any kind, then you can set up um, a kind of like, uh, so uh, I use pillowcases and I use bottles. So I take like a bottle like this and I cut off both sides here. So I make a tube, right? And I stick it in the mouth of the pillowcase and I roll it up and I stick that on the edge of a wall. Um, and typically snakes like to move along walls. So I would just, you know, take my hook and disturb the snake a little bit. So it moves along that wall. And the snake thinks of that hole, um, which is a tube made by the, the bottle as a burrow that it can escape into, and it just goes into the pillowcase all by itself. You don't even need to touch the snake most of the time. Um, so that's what I do nowadays. But back in the day, I was a little bit more, you know, like careless, and I would do a lot of random stuff. But I, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we call this the pipe and bag method. You stick a pipe in the uh, mouth of a bag, and then you use the hook to guide the snake into the bag. Um, you don't, you know, if you do it correctly, you don't even need to touch the snake. Sometimes you might need to hold the tail of the snake and, you know, pick it up with the hook and guide it inside. But um, most situations don't actually require that. So, you know, I haven't touched a venomous snake in like the last two years because, you know, I don't want to take that risk. So the natural follow up to this is what happens if you get bit or oh boy, once you get bit, because if you keep doing this, the a lot of probability is that eventually it's going to happen. So what happens then? Um, so, it, I mean, I think the protocol kind of differs um, based on what snake you've been bitten by. So the first thing is, if you know the identity of the snake, um, if it is a non-venomous snake that has bitten you, which I've been bitten by thousands of non-venomous snakes, um, and, you know, you just need to wash it off, maybe put a little antiseptic on it, that's all you really need to do. But if you've been bitten by a venomous snake, um, don't, you know, try to uh, get any, like, I don't know what they call it, like, um, traditional methods is, is what they use in India a lot. But basically, the bottom line is you need to get to the hospital as soon as you can. Because um, the only cure for a venomous snake bite is snake antivenom that's made from the venom of the species that bit you. You can't just take any random antivenom. So in India, we have 
four um, venomous species that cause a lot of uh, human fatalities. So we've got the speckled cobra, the Russell's viper, the uh, common crate, and the saw-scaled viper. And all four of those guys, um, there's a polyvalent antivenom serum that they have at most hospitals in India. Um, so you get there and they observe you for a little bit. They check to see if you've actually been bitten. They might do a blood clotting test to see if there's actually venom in your system because sometimes snakes may deliver a dry bite, which is where they bite you, but they don't release any venom. But you don't want to count on that. Um, so, yeah, they, they test you and then they pump you with that venom and hopefully that antivenom neutralizes the venom in your system and you'll be okay. I've heard that most snakes that are dangerous will have bright coloring to warn potential um, enemies about that. Is that how you tell if a snake that bit you is venomous? Um, not here. Um, and I don't think that's the best way to, you know, like go about deciding if a snake is venomous or not. Because yes, a lot of snakes have aposematic coloration um to tell predators that hey i'm venomous don't mess with me which is like the bright colors warn the predators but there's also plenty of snakes that you know kind of capitalize on the aposematic coloration of the venomous snakes so non-venomous snakes will mimic venomous snakes to try and fool predators into saying okay i'm also venomous don't mess with me either like a good example is the coral snakes in the u.s which are venomous and then the scarlet king snakes which are non-venomous. They look very, very similar, but one is deadly and one is not. Um, and if you look at our snakes here in India, yeah. Wait, go back, because you muted there for a sec. So just repeat like the last 10 seconds. <laughs> Start from where? Uh, the coral snakes. Okay, then... so a great example is the coral snake um, in the United States, which is venomous. And there's another snake that looks exactly like it or very similar to it. Uh, the scarlet king snake. So the coral snake is deadly. The scarlet king snake is not. And the scarlet king snake is this is called Batesian mimicry, where they um, a non-venomous species or a non-dangerous species tries to look like a dangerous species to fool predators that may prey on it um, into thinking that it is also venomous. Um, and the other thing is in India, like one of the most deadly snakes that causes a huge number of deaths is the speckled cobra. And it is just a dull brown color most of the time. So that's not a bright color. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't think looking at the color of the snake is a great way to decide if it's venomous or not. I think you need to um, memorize the venomous snakes or the deadly snakes in your area. If you can, memorize all the snakes in your area. I don't think there's going to be too many. Um, and be able to identify them just in case. Or, you know, it's it's also fun to look at snakes and, you know, it's kind of fascinating to see these snakes and see um, which ones are around your house and stuff like that. So yeah, you know, do the research, memorize which snakes are around your house. It's not super hard. It's it's pretty easy most of the time. I personally, so I've had a little bit of experience with the snake. I had a ball python in college. His name was Rico. I loved him. He was friendly. Um, and even when I go hiking now, I see garter snakes. I see rat snakes, and it's always so exciting. When I see a snake, uh, I know that there's no dangerous snake, so I'm not scared. And it just adds so much more excitement to that particular hike when I do see a snake. So I think kind of what I want a lot of our listeners to take away from this is that snakes do not necessarily equal deadly predator. Like they are just like seeing another animal out in nature. It could be really exciting and to know about these things. Um, it's good good to be a backyard ecologist and to be familiar with what's going on um, in your in your own backyard. Uh, For sure. So last thing that I want to touch on before we end, what are you currently working on? What are you doing? Uh, any cool research? How has COVID affect you? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, for the last year, I've been working on uh, King Cobra telemetry. So um, it's the King Cobra Ecology and Conservation Project at the uh, Agumbe Rainforest Research Station, which is in the uh, Western Ghats Rainforest of India. So we're trying to, uh, you know, understand more about the daily life of a King Cobra, which is, I think, classified as vulnerable. Um, and it only inhabits these primary rainforests along, uh, well, in, in South India, it only inhabits the uh, rainforest along the Western coast. 
but yeah, what we do is we uh, we've implanted radio transmitters in a few snakes, and uh, we follow them around with our antenna and receiver, and we're able to. So for the whole day, we follow these snakes and we watch what they do and we record their behavior. So what we're trying to identify is like how much they move and you know like what kind of habitats they're using, what they're eating, um, their interactions with other snakes, their interactions with other king cobras, things like that. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty cool. Um, I got to see a lot of cool stuff. I mean, just like following a single king cobra around every day, you get to like know that animal, you get to know like when he's going to move, what he's going to eat, all that stuff. So we've got to see these snakes, these king cobras eat mostly other snakes. So uh, yeah. it's just amazing. Yeah, Ophiophagus hannah is the uh, scientific name of the king cobra. And Ophio is snake. Um, phagus means to eat. So Ophiophagus is uh, snake eater. Um, so yeah, we get, we had to see these snakes. Uh, so the snakes that we track are about like uh, 12 to 13 feet long, which they're massive snakes. And they're about like this thick. Huge. Um, yeah. So we it's just amazing to see um, the snake that you've been following, like pick up the scent trail of a prey animal, maybe like a rat snake or maybe a pit viper or maybe even a speckled cobra and chase that animal down, grab it and, you know, swallow it. It's just it's an unreal experience to watch that stuff. And we're getting just amazing data that uh, um, I think like most of the other studies that focus on king cobras are like you don't get to see this behavior. You just kind of get, you know, like a, a few random tidbits of information here. We're watching the snakes every single you know, second that it's active. Um, so that's just amazing. Um, and how, like, are these snakes smart? Like, how intelligent is a snake? I think as far as snakes go, um, the king cobra is much smarter than other snakes. Because, really? like, if I'm, if I'm, like, here, you know, trying to catch a spectacle cobra, which is, like, pretty common around my neighborhood here in Bangalore, where I'm living right now, um, when I go to catch it, you know, I can completely predict the snake's behavior and the snake is just kind of randomly you know striking or like hooding up or doing whatever and not really looking at me to try and anticipate my movements or my next move right but a king cobra um when a king cobra looks at you it'll look at you in the eyes and it tries to um anticipate your next move so these snakes are extremely smart um and the snakes that we've been following we don't try to antagonize them we don't even get close enough where we, the snake knows that we're there, right? So we're kind of just following from, you know, a distance and we're watching these snakes do their own thing, you know, in their own habitat. And the way these snakes kind of like pinpoint prey or like um, during the breeding season, find a female and sometimes fight with other males to get with that female, it's just just unreal. Like you, you don't think of these snakes as being smart enough to be able to do some of this stuff, but it's, yeah, they just surprise you. Um, last question on comments. This is something right. that I personally have always been very curious about. What is the point of a cobra's, like, what do you even call it? Like, the area, the thing is out like that. Um, the hood? The hood. What is the point of that? Okay, so every snake has an int intimidation tactic when it faces a predator, right? Like so, rattle, um, rattle, exactly, rattle. exactly. Yeah. So rattlesnake will, you know, rattle its rattle and try to say, Hey, I'm dangerous or leave me alone. Um, you know, you don't want to mess with me, things like that. So the cobra is the exact same way the, it hoods up and it hopes that the animal that's messing with it is going to get scared by that, you know, behavior and leave it alone. So a lot of snakes that aren't dangerous, um, for example, the uh, uh, the eraser in the U.S. right, it will uh, sometimes rattle its tail, the tip of its tail, in leaf litter to make predators think that it is a rattlesnake or dangerous. Um, so every single snake has its own intimidation tactic or defensive behavior, and um, yeah, some of the defensive behaviors of snakes are just super interesting. There's a there's a snake in India called the green vine snake. And it looks like a piece of, like, just a vine, a green, you know, piece of plant. That's what it looks like. Um, but when you get up and start messing with it or, like, you know, it feels threatened by your presence, then it will expand its body to expose its black and white skin underneath. 
So yeah. it changes its color basically because the scales are green, but the skin underneath is black and white. So there's that. And then it opens its mouth and it, you know, looks super scary and stuff like that. So yeah. That's awesome, man. Dude, I've <laughs> I've gained a whole new appreciation for snakes thanks to this discussion. So thank you, Yatin. Thanks uh, for having me, man. Yeah, dude. We we're coming up on the one hour line and I know it's super late over there in Bangalore. So thank you so much for coming on, dude. It's literally I'm so glad that I was able to have you on as one of my guests. Uh, I think you did us all a great favor by teaching us of snakes and their conservation and how you can get involved in that. So I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. And I think it's great what you've done with the uh, Zebra brand. Like, um, I, yeah, I've, I've been looking forward to watch your new documentary and all that great stuff. I think, yeah, I'm just so happy that I was able to be a part of this. Thanks for having me on. Man. I appreciate it. Buddy. Have a good night. All right. You too. All right, homie. We did it. Join us on future episodes of Talking Wild every Monday as we have more fascinating guests join us to talk about everything nature, wildlife, and conservation. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know by liking and sharing. And if you'd like to support Zeba, head over to our website at zebaapparel.com to shop your favorite Zeba merch. Thank you for joining us and remember to stay wild.